if all the righteous men in the old covenant show up now, they suddenly become filthy rags. But the superiority of the new covenant is that if we go into the old covenant, we'll still be righteous. Because what we are working with now is superior to what they worked with. Because we are not just righteous because of what we are doing. Righteousness has been updated. The revelation and the concept has been upgraded. So you need to understand righteousness in the New Testament. What's the problem of many Christians? When they do good, they feel bold before God. It's a filthy rag. That's why some of you here, the day you pray for four hours, you think you can cast out demons. And then you are coming before the demon on the strength of your prayer. It's a filthy rag. The day you gave a huge offering, you feel that God loves you. And then you are coming before God as some of his ambassadors. It's a filthy rag. You check yourself for the past 10 years since I gave my heart to Christ. I've never fornicated. And you are standing on the strength of your purity. It's a filthy rag. God is not against all of it, but there's now a balance. Everything you do now, there's no place for boasting. Because all you are and all you are standing on is what Christ has done. So should you live pure? Yes. But your purity is no longer you that do it. It's the grace of God in you. Should you pray and fast? Yes. But you are not casting out demons because you fasted. It's because of the power that Jesus gave you on account of his resurrection. Are you seeing the difference? So we do the same thing they did in the Old Testament. But the credibility is not to us. Because it's not our power that is doing it. I cannot pray for 24 hours by my strength. When I do it, it's because there's a spirit on my inside groaning. It's that spirit that energizes me. So I can never take the credit for praying for 24 hours. I will say, the spirit of resurrection is at work on my inside. That's why he said that we know not what to pray for as we ought to. He said, but the spirit, my God, everything we do now is by the spirit. So we will still do it, but there is a different economy. I will not lie i will not fornicate i will not manipulate but i can't take the credit because we have this treasure in 18 vessel that the excellency might be of god and not of man and so even the day that i don't pray i will meet the devil with boldness the day that i pray i will meet the devil with boldness i pray because i love god i pray because i am growing and i pray because my prayer is part of the system of administration in Zion. The Bible said the prayers of the saints are sent to heaven as others. They are stored in golden vials. So when God wants to trigger revival in Afghanistan, it may be my prayer that he will use. So I will keep praying because now I have joined divine administration. That's why the Bible said he has made us to become partakers of the divine. So we now co-rule with God. When God wants to bring revival to Cameroon, who knows if my 40 days prayer will produce incense in heaven. So it is an administrative system. That's why I won't stop praying, but I won't take credit for anything God is doing. Everything that God does is Christ in me, the hope of glory. This is righteousness. So defining it in context, what is righteousness in the New Testament? Number one is the gift of God. Romans 5.17 is the gift of God. I didn't merit it. I didn't earn it. He gifted me righteousness. If by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more, they will receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. So I reign not because I have rank, not because I have stature, not because I have record. Records are important. It reveals my love for God. It reveals my maturity in the faith. It reveals my participation in divine administration. However, I can't take credit for it because it's a gift. They will receive abundance of grace. And of the gift of righteousness shall reign. I reign in life because I have a gift called righteousness. Number two, what is righteousness in the context of the New Testament? is a standing with God based on the finished works of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him that was without sin to become sin for us so that we, so that we, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's a standing with God because 
of the finished works of Christ. Righteousness is the, in the Old Testament is a standing with God because of your works. Righteousness in the New Testament is a standing with God because of the finished works of Christ. So if I fast for 40 days now, like Moses fasted, and both of us are standing, I will never present my fast before God. If I come before God, I will say thank you, Father, for Jesus that causes us to triumph always and make manifest the savour of his will. So I will fast as much as they fasted in the Old Testament. I will pray as much as they prayed in the Old Testament. I will live even purer than they lived in the Old Testament. But it is Christ in me that is working. Philippians 2.13 it is God that walketh in you. But to will and to do of his good pleasure. I'm showing you why many Christians fluctuate. The Bible said the part of the justified is as a shiny light. It shines brighter and brighter. If you start preaching every day, you understand what I'm telling you. There are meetings I go for. I'm raging like lightning. I can't even contain what I'm feeling. My God. Sometimes the intensity is so much you want to vaporize. But the other meetings you go for, you are weak and afraid. If you will command the same result, you must learn to take your eyes from what you have done. Even though you will do it forever and ever and put your eyes on what Jesus has done. And many times is the hour when you are weakest that you see the greatest power to show you that although you should fast, although you should pray, but God didn't move because of you. He moved because Jesus was on the cross. He moved because Jesus obeyed. And this is why for those of us in the New Testament, we can dare anything. Because any day, any time, we are operating by the gift of righteousness. We are operating by a standing that Jesus' work procured for us. Finally, what is righteousness in the New Testament? Hmm. Are you learning something? <laughs> righteousness in the New Testament is living with a renewed understanding that you have a standing with God, you have a gift with God, and you have the nature of God. Therefore, you must live like God. It's what? Living with a renewed understanding that you have a gift from God, you have a standing with God based on Christ, and you have the nature of God. Therefore, you must live like God. Ephesians 4, 23 to 24. You must live like God. For it's a be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Next verse. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. In righteousness and what? true holiness. This is why I said number one you have what? A gift from God. Number two you have what? A standing from God. Number three you have what? The nature of God. Now that you have a gift from God a standing from God and the nature of God. You must be renewed to live like God because of that gift because of that standing and because of that nature. He said the new man that is created that's the nature after righteousness and true holiness. Next verse. See the life. We are for putting away lying. Speaking. Every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one body. Next verse. Read it to 31. Be ye angry and sin not. Let the sun not go down upon your wrath. Next verse. Neither give place to the devil. Next verse. All of this is righteousness. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, walking with his hands, which is good, that he may have to give. Next verse. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of their defying, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. Are you seeing that you must now live like God? Because you now have a mindset. So there is a mindset dimension of righteousness that I must live like God in every circumstance. So a man who has that nature, who has that gift, and who has that standing, but not that mindset, his experiential righteousness will be deficient. 
There are quarters where they define righteousness only as nature. It is not complete. There are quarters where they define righteousness only as gift. It's not complete. There are quarters where they define righteousness only as a standing with God because of Jesus. It's not complete. The three must add together. And in addition to the three, there must be a mindset. That now that I have that nature, there are things I can no longer do. 1 John 3, 7 and 10. See the way the Bible puts it. It says, little children, let no man deceive you. Because only children will be deceived. That's why many places people say they have the nature of God. So when they fornicate, nothing is wrong. God is not angry. They don't understand righteousness. Although they have the gift, they will always stand with God based on the finished works of Christ. But they are not thinking like God. Jesus won't think that way. This is why many quarters, people say, we won't pray. We already have authority. That's not how God thinks. Jesus prayed every day. In Mark 1.35, he said in the cool of the day, he went to a solitary place. There he prayed. This is why many people say, I won't give. After all, I'm already blessed. Jesus doesn't operate like that. All his life, he gave until he gave himself. He gave money. He gave the anointing. He gave healing. He gave compassion. He gave himself ultimately. You cannot not think like Christ if you say you are righteous. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth, righteousness is done. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Even as he is righteous. If he is righteous and he did, what type of righteousness do you have that you will not do? In verse 10 he said, Hearing are the children of God separated from the children of the devil in doing righteousness. In this, the children of God are manifest from the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteous is not of God. Neither he had the love for his brother. You can't have that nature and not do it. Why am I talking like this? Because I'm a man. Imagine I showed up here and I start doing, whoa, whoa, whoa. You say, ah, something is wrong. Go. Because men don't back. God don't fornicate. God don't lie. God is not mischievous. So if you have his nature, you can't do that. So righteousness has four expressions in the New Testament. A gift, the nature of God, it said we were created in Christ Jesus unto every good works. Ephesians 2.10 A right standing with God based on the works of Jesus. He made him that was without sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God and a mindset, a renewed mindset after righteousness and true holiness. It is in the doing part that righteousness and holiness becomes one. That's why that mindset brings you into righteousness and holiness. New Testament theology. What's the difference with the Old Testament? They didn't have the nature of God. So every righteous act they did was from their flesh. And it was already condemned. Number two, what's the difference between this and the Old Testament? Your standing with God is not based on what you do. It's based on what Jesus did. What's the difference between this and the Old Testament? You will live right as they live right in the Old Testament. But you are living right now by the power of the Holy Ghost. Sponsored from the place of a renewed understanding. Not the strength of your flesh. That's why when a man falls, he asks for grace. It's not resolution. You don't make resolutions when you fall. When you fall, you ask for grace. Because it's not your energy that sponsors your life. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. He said, where sin abounds. He said, dear, grace abounds much more. Finally, what is holiness? Holiness is consecration to God to live out the God life. Remember, sanctification is consecration from sin, from the world, from evil. Righteousness is standing with God because of his nature and because of the gift. Holiness is consecration to God. Now that I'm standing with God, I will seek him. I will live for him. I will serve him. So in holiness, I am gravitated towards God. Because in him we live. In him we move. And in him we have our being. So the way they manifested holiness in the Old Testament is by obedience. Leviticus 20, 7 to 8. Quickly, I'm rounding up. Sanctify yourself therefore and be ye holy. For I am the Lord your God. Verse 8. 
and ye shall keep my status and do them. I am the Lord that sanctifies you. So in the Old Testament, as sanctification, so is holiness, is by obeying God. So when a man is holy, he pays his tithe. When a man is holy, he must go to church. If he doesn't go to church, he's not holy. If a man is holy, he must attend all the feasts that God prescribed. If a man is holy, every instruction God gives, he must do it. That is the basis for holiness in the Old Testament. In Exodus 19, verse 4 to 5, it said, If you will hearken to my voice and keep my covenant, then shall ye be a peculiar people, a holy nation. So people are separated to God in the Old Testament by their works. But when you came into, come into the New Testament, the modality becomes different. See, if you don't know this, you will struggle. Please take time and meditate on this message and understand the essence of the teaching. This is where rest and true dominion comes from. See, there was a time in my life that if I don't pray, I'm afraid. Because I feel I can't do anything for God. So I prayed like Roko. And prayer had nothing to do with intimacy. It had everything to do with keeping a target so that I will feel sure. Until I discovered righteousness. I knew that everything I did and modeled, my victories, my exploits, were all based on my faith in what Jesus did. I was delivered. I pray more now, but I pray from the place of intimacy. I pray from the place of understanding. I pray from the place of participation with the Godhead. It brings more refreshing and authority. I'm telling you why Christians struggle. They have not understood Christianity from the vent of the new covenant. What is holiness in the new covenant? Number one, holiness is living according to the nature of God or the nature of of righteousness first peter 1 15 and 16 colossians 1 22 2 quickly but as he which has called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation verse 16 because it is written be holy as i am holy you have my nature now so if i'm holy you too be holy so it's a life sponsored from the holy nature of God. So I'm not holy now because I'm trying to know some rules to obey them. I am holy now because I'm living based on the promptings of the life of God. Now when you live based on that life, you will discover that you will keep all the rules. But the rules will no longer be burdensome. Hope you know if they told you every day wake up, waking up will become a law. And some will not wake up. But because there is nature, the moment is daybreak, nature will wake you up. So all you need to do is to what? Structure, manage, and fare for your nature so that your nature can work well. So when I am meditating on the word, praying, coming to God's presence, I'm trying to doctor my holy nature. And when I doctor my holy nature, my holy nature now will make me live holy. So right, holiness now is not a law I'm obeying. That's external. Holiness now is a nature I'm living out. That's internal. The economy of the Old Testament is external. The economy of the New Testament is internal. So we are not keeping God's law. We are living as sons of God. At the end of the day, as they are commanded not to fornicate in the Old Testament, so will you also not fornicate. As they are commanded not to be covetous, so will you also not be covetous. But now, you are not not fornicating just because it's a commandment. You are not fornicating because your nature abhors it. You are not being covetous, not just because it's a commandment, because your nature abhors it. So at the end of the day, all of us will live out the laws of God, but from a different perspective. This is nature-oriented life. Colossians 1.22. Quickly, quickly, I'm rounding up. In the body of his flesh, through death, he has presented you holy, unblameable, and irreprovable in his sight nature finding expression in the body of his flesh you are now part of that body and it's on the strength of your response to that body that you are presented holy what's the second expression of holiness in the new testament living by faith 
and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Living by faith and by the power. I trust God to keep me holy. And as I yield to the power of the Holy Ghost, I live holy. I'm not obeying rules and regulations. Hebrews 12, 14. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. So you see that you are actually living it out. But there's a power sponsoring it. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. For God had not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. There is a power that brings you into it. It's a calling. It's a calling. And as sanctification is, so also is holiness. What is holiness? Number three in the New Testament. It is manifesting the excellency of God. So when you are studying the revelation of holiness in the New Testament, it begins with consecration unto God. But the highest revelation of holiness is beauty, is excellence, is godliness. That a point comes when you become perfect as he is perfect. You know, there are many people who tell us that no man is perfect. That's not true. You know why they conclude that way? Because they think perfection is a feat you should attain by your fleshly ability. And they have concluded that no man can. The Bible says, be ye perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That means men can be perfect. While we are growing, we may not have attained perfection. I have not. But it doesn't mean I cannot. Because if it is God that worketh in me, both to do and to will, then God can make me as he is. This is where the apostles got to. And John will say, as he is. He says, so are we, not in heaven, in this world. You know what John said? He said, hearing is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. What, what are you talking about? So a man can approach the judgment seat of Christ and the white throne seat without fear. Because he has walked in God until as he is, so he is. He didn't say because God will show mercy. He said for as he is. So a man can come to a level where he has grown into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. And he has also grown into him in all things. Even Christ, the head of the church. That possibility is there. That is the zenith of holiness. And that's what Peter spoke about in 1 Peter 2.9. He said you are a chosen generation. A holy nation. Who is a holy nation? Hear Peter's definition. A special people that manifest the glory, the virtue, the excellency of God. So holiness begins with consecration to God. But that's the lowest revelation of holiness. The highest revelation of holiness is manifesting the beauty of God. The excellency of God. The glory of God. The perfection of God. So holiness is not just consecration to God. Holiness is beauty. Holiness is perfection. Holiness is excellence. So a day comes in your life when men see you, they have seen God. Your appearance is exactly like the appearance of God. This is what Paul was teaching in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Be ye followers of me as I'm the follower of Christ. It's only grace that can do that. But you see, our holiness is still the Old Testament holiness. We are trying to live right first by obeying instruction and secondly, by exerting our will. That's why we keep failing. In the New Testament, you are not holy because you are obeying instructions. You are not holy because you are exerting your will. In the New Testament, you are holy because, number one, you are conscious that you have God's nature. Number two, you are living by the power of the Holy Ghost. Number three, you are living and expressing the perfection and the beauty of God because grace sponsors your existence. There's nothing you do anymore by your willpower. You do all you do because grace sponsors it. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, I labor more than they all. He said, yet not I, but the grace of God that is in me. A generation that will be holy is a generation that will understand absolute yieldedness to the power of the Holy Ghost and the operation of grace. If a generation does not yield to the power of the Holy Ghost, if a generation does not understand grace, that generation can never be holy. It will be a generation still trying to obey rules and regulation from the place of the strength of the flesh. And that's a failed generation from the start. This is New Testament definition of sanctification. 
righteousness and holiness. If I had time, I would have spoken about the church. But maybe next time. Because in the New Testament, church is not building. In the Old Testament, church is first of all a tabernacle. Build according to the pattern that was revealed to you from the mount. So the presence of God was in the tabernacle. The worship of God was in the tabernacle. The sacrifices of God were in the tabernacle. If you are outside the tabernacle, you are outside of church. Because that's where you do the sacrifice. That's where you meet the presence. That's where you worship God. He now migrated to a temple. Because in the tabernacle, there is not enough room for the whole body of Christ to come in. So only those who are doing ritual and worship enters. But in the temple, they enlarged it. It became more permanent. So that people can come and sit and hear the word of God. But that's still not church. Church in the New Testament is number one, you and I. Him that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 and 19. He that is joined to the Lord is what? One spirit. So you carry the presence of God. The presence of God is not just in the building. You are the living sacrifice. So you are not taking a sacrifice to offer anywhere. He said, beloved, present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable one to God. You are the sacrifice. And then you are also the carrier of the presence. And then you are also the tabernacle of God. This is where worship takes place. That's why worship is not a song. Worship is yieldedness to the government of the Holy Ghost. Father, it is not my will but thine. Every time you submit your will to God, worship has risen. And that worship can be louder than 100 people in an auditorium singing good songs. In the New Testament, church number two is the gathering together of the saints. So wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. If we move from this building under the tree, church is now under that tree. This is a tent. This is not church. Until today, there are lots of rituals around pulpit. You see, they put a barrier, put a barrier that this is a holy place. Oh God, relax. Everywhere you enter becomes holy because you come with God's presence. The place is not holy just because you did a service there. The place is holy because holy men of God have shown up. He said, knowing this first, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. He said, holy men of God moved as they were carried by the spirit of God. He said, lift up holy hands. Anywhere we come, we are the ones that bring holiness there. And so if we move from here to under a tree, that becomes church. It's the gathering together of the saints. He said, behold, how beautiful and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in harmony. It's like the oil flowing from the head of Aaron down to his beard, to his head. There, the Lord commands his blessing. So anywhere we gather, that's where the blessing is. If this building is not here, church continues. I just returned from Lagos. Pastor Shola Shumakinde's building was burned, but church remained. We marched to another building and that became church because the church is the gathering together of the saints. I'm telling you this so you are conscious. Most of you, two or three of you live together in one house. You are fighting and then you religiously dress up on Sunday and come to a building and you think now that you have come to building, you are in church. No, you have left church and entered the building. That's why you see three, four Christians fighting. They are pious when they are in a building, but they have no consciousness that our gathering is a church. The name of the Lord is there. So we are doing what we are doing. We are still religious. People can't trust God for anything until they are in a building. Not the gathering, you know. So somebody will travel. He said he wants to go to that altar and make contact. I'm not saying God is not in places. Please don't get me wrong. There are places where the weight of God's presence dwells. But I'm saying primarily the church is where the ark is and the ark now is here. So I cannot have more faith going to a building than to be conscious that Christ in me is the hope of glory. God dwells here. I'm the tabernacle of the living God. What is church number three? Is the universal body of Christ. The general assembly of all believers. Colossians 1.19 said, we are his body. And he said, he is the head of the church. 
So the universal body, what you call the Catholic Church, not Roman Catholic, what you call the Catholic Church, the universal expression of believers is also the church. So church is individual, is the gathering of the saints, and is the universal expression of believers. So anywhere believers are, church is there. That's why when Paul persecuted the church, Jesus showed up, said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He was not even anywhere on earth, but it's one. Every, every expression that connects to Jesus becomes church. Why do we now build tents? We are not building tents because we want to go back to the old covenant. This is why we have to be careful. Because today, we give more honor to building than believers. This is why we have to be careful. Because today, we treat buildings as more sacred than believers. Because we are going back to the Old Testament. So believers are not taught to manifest God in the market. Believers are not taught to express God in, the, in their family. They are taught to express God here. So everybody is a guest preacher. is a guest artist. And all our songs are sung on platforms and in conferences. Meanwhile, most of the songs God gives us is to sing it to him or to sing it to the body of believers. But everything has become organized system where people gather together. And platform is where God dwells. We have gone back to the Old Testament. Is it okay to build? Yes. Is there a concentrated presence of God in the building? Yes. But church is the people. Why do we now gather? Number one, for protection. If we are under the tree and it starts raining, how, how do we walk? We are using keyboards and microphones. If they are under the rain and it starts raining, it will destroy them. So we need shelter for protection. We need it for preservation. We need it for order. Why are we all seated orderly? Imagine if 10,000 people were to gather under a tree. How will it look like? So building brings protection. Building brings preservation. Building brings order. But we must have a superior revelation. Don't be pious in the building on Sunday morning and be reckless in the office on Monday morning. It means you don't know the church. You are in the Old Testament and you have been mentored to operate like a man in the days of Moses. Don't neglect the gathering in the building. But over and above that, sustain a superior consciousness. In Hebrews 10.25, the Bible said, do not despise the gathering together of the saints. So anywhere we are, whether it's a building or in a tree, be there. There are many people today that if they enter a building that does not have AC, that the wall is not decorated and there's no LED, they don't think it's a serious church. They just behave casually. Even ministers, invite them for a meeting. If they show up and the place is not elitist, they undermine everything. Because to them, church is building. When they enter a cathedral where there are speakers, where there are LED screens, that day they are under the anointing. They will preach their intestine out. But when they go to a touch house where believers gather, they will act casually because to them church is building. To them church is edifice. They are still in the days of tabernacles and temples. They have not migrated to the eternal tabernacle which is the body of Christ. In fact, there are many preachers, there are many music artists that don't go to places where they don't have excellent edifice. Because as far as they are concerned, the people mean nothing. Everything is the building. They don't know church. New Testament theology. Lift your hands to heaven. We're out of time. Have you been blessed? Don't act pious on Sunday alone. On Monday, be on fire. On Tuesday, be on fire. Don't cast out demons only in the building. When you enter the market, cast out demons. The anointing is not just for the building. Even when you walk into the market, carry the anointing. Carry the anointing. The church follows you everywhere you go. If you think church is only building, when you walk out of that door, you will think you are out of church. But we are not designed to go out of church. If we go out of church, we'll be in trouble. The Bible said, he will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So every time you are out of the building, if you are out of church, it means you are vulnerable. The reason the devil can't prevail against me is because wherever I am, I'm the church that God is building. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against me. Superior 
revelation. My beloved is the most beautiful amongst thousands and thousands. <laughs> 